Uh, my name is Jeremy Potash, and I'm with the California Asia Business Council. Um, extremely delighted to be here. Uh, China's environment, what do we know and how do we know it? Well, since yesterday, I've learned a great deal. Um, about eight points. I, I put, put all the things together that I learned from yesterday. And number one was how difficult it is to put together a conference like this and how important it is to thank the organizers. So if you could start with me, uh, share with me a rousing round of applause for Tom Gold <laughs> and the Berkeley China Initiative. I also learned that um, this is this is uh, these are just com compiled thoughts from yesterday about the difficulties in getting good clean data, the abundance of controversial data, false data, fluid data, counterbalanced to some extent by extrapolated data, empirical data using GSI, etc. I've learned about the rule of law that's lacking, the transparency lacking. Uh, we didn't go into it, but if I'd heard about IPR, I would have heard about IPR violations. Uh, in agriculture, I heard about lack of education, lack of familiarity with procedures, lack of training. And on the other hand, I heard about abundant resolve, a definite commitment, a determined effort to improve energy efficiency that began in 1980, uh, making China the energy efficiency grandparent. I learned about a central government commitment well communicated to provincial authorities, a strong and collective will to take the steps necessary towards energy success. I learned about a deep natural concern, national concern about climate change. And there's some conflicts here. Um, so I guess the cons the, my consensus understanding is that China has major problems in energy and agriculture, and we're gonna learn a lot today about an even more critical problem, which is water. Um, and a lot of very good people are trying very hard to do things about it, to find the solutions. And because of my background, which is working with companies, my membership is comprised of companies, and my principal partner is the US Commercial Service, and a lot of what I do, um, we look for business opportunities in this, um, at this quest for sustainable development. So it, it's a particular pleasure that I'm able to moderate this panel this morning uh, with the very distinguished panelists that we have in front of you. Um, I hope they don't mind me calling them China hands, uh, but in fact, um, they've earned that sobriquet uh, from the work that they've been doing uh, over most of their careers. Uh, we're going to, we did a little um, um, sharing of information this morning. We're gonna change the order just a wee bit, and we're going to start uh, with uh, Po Chi Wu. And you're going to hear, um, from these gentlemen um, about the about turning green into green and the problems that are going to be facing companies, uh, U.S. companies, foreign investors as they wish to enter the China market. Um, but I would underscore um, that the opportunities for partnership are immense, and they um, it it doesn't have to be just U.S. technology service products going into China, but clearly. Clearly, there needs to be a sharing because China has clearly developed a lot of its own solutions and those solutions could equally be applied here because indeed we also have uh, significant environmental problems. Uh, po Chi Wu has been a venture capitalist uh, investor, entrepreneur, business development R&D executive and his bio is in the, the materials that was provided to you. I've known of Po Chi for a number of years as being a very dynamic uh, member of the venture capital community, um, a visionary, and welcome him this morning. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Appreciate a kind introduction, and thank you, Tom, for the, intro, uh, the uh, invitation to participate. I think this is a wonderful opportunity. I'm very excited about uh, to meet all of the people here and, and to hear uh, these different points of view. And I'm going to share uh, my own very personal kind of point of view, which tends to be a little bit more philosophical and full of soft data. Right? Because, and and you'll, you'll understand more why, why I think that's important. I think that one of the, one of the important differences between the way scientists and academic uh, researchers look at the world and the way business people look at the world is business people understand they have to act on imperfect data. 
imperfect, incomplete data, and you have to make choices. You have no, there, there is just, there's no other alternative. You have to continue to proceed, and you have to balance, and you have to make trade-offs, right? So, so that's, that's just one of the realities of life. And uh, the topic of my, my uh, presentation is about, I say, discontinuities and paradoxes, because I think this is a good way to think about China, and, and you'll, again, you'll see what I mean by that. I think China, uh, at, at least at this particular point in time, is going through some discontinuities in, in history, in culture, uh, in, in what they have to face. Uh, of course, the environmental challenges, the economic challenges, the growth of the country, uh, political systems, I mean, everything, there, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's really quite, quite chaotic in, in both the positive and, and negative senses of that term. Paradoxes really refers more to how we, uh, from the outside, we meaning both uh, people like myself, who I consider myself bicultural, but I, I was trained, I'm a Berkeley grad, I'm a Princeton grad, I, I understand the American culture very, very well. Uh, and I look at China, I think it's paradoxical. I think that many Chinese who are more thoughtful might also see China as, as somewhat paradoxical. And, and we can explore that. So the, um, the most important thing is, is what I was saying. My point of view is I want to explore how to mobilize capital to benefit, to create value. And, and that means in you know, any number of dimensions of what a value might mean. So let me get this um, into this mode. And so uh, let me ask quickly uh, among the audience, if you could just raise your hand, how many in this audience have visited China within the last three years? Wow, almost all of you, great. How many of you consider China and China's growth a challenge to be feared? Ah, very few, half. And how many consider China an opportunity? So it should be the rest of you, right? All right, good, I love that. So that, that's what I think. I think China is all about fear and fascination. And I think most, you, you know, this crowd here is different. You're, you're, you're here, you're in Berkeley. Many of you are, of course, associated with the university and you're more thoughtful and, and you see things a little differently. I, I would claim, I, my observation, my sense is that most of America, at least, really fears China. In, 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 you know, in, in almost in a xenophobic sort of sense, but fear in multiple dimensions, uh, from the economic growth, from the perceived loss of jobs, from the natural resource uh, consumption, from the environmental pollution. I mean, all of these reasons, there certainly is plenty of reason to, to, to feel that way. Uh, and at the same time, because of the paradoxes, because of, 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 of China's culture and history and, and the fact that China has really demonstrated quite remarkable capabilities uh, historically and currently, it is fascinating. Okay, so that's important because this is part of what drives a, an investor. An investor is fascinated, for someone like myself, consider myself a technology investor, more of a visionary investor, not a venture, uh, not one of these um, uh, financial investors that looks only at uh, established uh, balance sheets and, and you know, there's careful projections and all that. I think none of that works very well in China, at least in, in earlier stage companies. So it's all about the balance, again, between fear and fascination. Okay, so, whoops, um, yeah, okay, so, so when, I, when I think about fear and fascination, I think about risk, right? Risk for an investor, um, in Chinese particularly, they translate the term for venture capital as risk capital, and risk capital was the old term for venture capital a long time ago, and, and I think it's part of, of Silicon Valley's heritage that we have modify that term because we want to focus on entrepreneur, on, on creating new businesses, on new ventures. We think of it as more entrepreneurial uh, development, entrepreneurial capital. But in actually most of the world, in Europe as well, they think of it as risk capital. Now, what does risk mean? And this is a, this is a key point. And, and in China, um, I'm, I'm going to throw this out because I think this is another one of the major themes in my talk, is all about the context in China. It's very difficult for us 
from the outside to understand really what is the context in China. What is going on in China? How do we see that? What are the values that the Chinese people have for themselves and for their country? We don't understand that, but, but they have to understand that. And if I want to invest in China, I have to understand what they want to do with their businesses and their lives. So I do deal a lot with soft data. Okay, hard data I need. I need as much help and support from uh, academics and, and researchers and, 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 and econo economists and other people who really do generate hard numbers. But I need a lot of soft data. I need to know how people interact. I need to know what motivates people, um, what are going to move markets, basically. So I'm interested in stories, experiences. I need, what, I need to know what people really, how people want to live, how people want to, to build their societies. And my, my framework is I want to see this determined by market forces, meaning at some point money has to change hands. Money is a kind of fuel. Money, whether you call it a necessary evil or whatever you, you think of it, it is necessary. It, it is one of the means by which uh, we, we um, are, are able to, to mobilize resources and mobilize people to actually create something. Okay. Um, what happened? I missed something. Excuse me. Oh, dear. Oh, okay. Um, what, one thing, because I added a couple slides last night after, <laughs> after I heard all those challenging and stimulating uh, presentations yesterday, I said, oh, I, I need to add a couple things. So this is a very important one because of all the data points that were discussed yesterday about the resources and pollution and all of these things. One thing that I am most concerned about is, uh, is, an, is another resource which is very evident in China, which is the energy, the dynamic energy of the entrepreneurs in China. Okay? This is very hard to measure, obviously, because who knows what, what that means. But we've seen that. We've seen that, what, I think they, the Forbes did a survey in 2006. There are already over 300,000 Chinese who have accumulated a net worth of over a million dollars. And that's just the ones that they can measure. So maybe there's two times that, three times that, five times that, who knows. Everyone understands that in China, the gray economy, the, the, the undocumented, the Mm, call it quasi-legal or not legal kind, of, and I don't mean the, the criminal side. Um, uh, a business is, is, is obviously several times what the, the reported numbers are. But there is a tremendous energy in China, and that's very exciting. So even the, this whole business, we, we, uh, people who are concerned with things like intellectual property think of copying and piracy, and, and they see that as, as a terrible thing. But the flip side of that is that what that means is that the Chinese are really, really good at taking successful models and scaling them up very fast. Okay? That's a really important concept. If we can help them, we meaning everyone, the international community especially, not, not so much the U.S., but if, if, if all of us can, can show, can provide better tools, provide better guidance, uh, help them develop what can be successful models, they will scale. And they will solve problems like environmental problems or, or other resource issues. I believe that because I'm an optimist, not because I'm Chinese or, or, or some other reason. And so what, what, do they, what is the key to that, of course, is they understand how to improve price performance, and that's based on their intelligence, their cleverness, their, their strength, and their experience in manufacturing. Manufacturing is extraordinarily important, and this is one of the things we have a lot of debates about China and India, how these are both growing economies, what's the difference, what's so and so, but one of the key advantages that China has, and India has its own, uh, is, the, is the manufacturing expertise. Manufacturing is really very, very important. Okay. So, um, back to my personal point of view, I, as an investor, I ask questions. The more intelligent investors ask better questions, less intelligent investors last, ask poorer questions. Scholars, researchers, you, you, you gather data, you want to understand things, you have a different time frame, but entrepreneurs have to create businesses. It's very important. So another theme throughout my uh, presentation is really what kinds of questions are we asking 
productive questions, effective questions. This is what we ask, this is how I challenge entrepreneurs that I invest in. Are you asking the right questions? I can ask them questions that they may not have thought of. And if that happens in the course of an interview, I'll never invest in that particular project because they don't know, if they can't answer it, they, they, don't, know the, they don't know their business well enough. It's not that I know their business better, I don't. Okay? I don't have the depth of knowledge, either technical or market knowledge, and that's not important. I need to probe an entrepreneur to understand where their weak points are. That's what I do. So here is another provocative thought. If clean tech is going to be the next industrial revolution, will clean tech in China as a concept be the next societal revolution? Okay, and I'm taking politics out and ideology out. I'm just saying that if China, if China can, and I hope not, not an if, maybe when, when China figures out how to deal with clean technology, environmental issues, and all this, what will that mean for society in China and, and the global society? So I just throw that out there. And the, and the last question I think many, many presenters have asked is, what are we doing to prepare ourselves for that? Now, this is an, uh, one of the things that I, I alluded to earlier. I claim that China is a land of metaphors, culturally, linguistically, and there are other uh, academic researchers that have done an excellent job of this. I bring this out because I think that the contrast is that the United States, especially among all the countries in the world, is a land of abstract concepts. We love abstract concepts. We were created based on the ideas of the uh, a Bill of Rights, our Constitution. These are very abstract uh, statements of, of purpose, of mission. And, you know, it doesn't always translate very well into other countries. And I'm not even talking about democracy and political systems and all that. Just different kinds of ideas. So context is everything in China. How green is green and all these things. And, and, and again, many, many um, uh, other uh, presenters have, have spoken about all of these things. Uh, unintended bias is a really important question. Bottom line is we measure only what we can understand, right? We, uh, we have only can measure what our tools can do, and we can only improve what we can measure. So if we don't measure, if we don't start to set some boundaries around what we can do, we can't really improve. This, these are just some images that I took off of the internet. I stole them from somebody. Um, uh, it's just all about contrast. There are some pictures of horrible uh, uh, polluted rivers and, and, and polluted cities, uh, and at the same time, uh, you know, glitzy uh, nightscape in, in, in Shanghai. Actually, I think that's Hong Kong. Um, and, and the automobile industry, which is going to be one of the drivers of, the, of growth in China. What is the challenge in China? It's growth and stability. You've heard this many, many times. But there are some questions that haven't been raised, which are, what, are the, uh, what do these ecosystems look like in China? And, and I don't mean the environmental, natural ecosystem. I'm talking about the, the human dynamics of, of, of academics and government officials and businesses and entrepreneurs and so on. Um, metrics, of, metrics of success is very important. You know, Again, that, that, that goes, speaks to the idea of values. What, what are the values uh, that, that people in China have? And, and, and I don't mean, the, again, the political leaders. But who are natural leaders? Who are the people within the society who are making change? Uh, and again, some are academics, some are, are government officials, some are, are researchers, some are, are entrepreneurs. This is a very philosophical concept that, that I have that's certainly not novel. It's simply saying that leadership uh, is, is really all about integrity and accountability. And, and I think China, uh, China is, is exploring what it means to have leadership because it is coming into a role where it has to assume some leadership in a global community. Uh, this is an example, this is a data point this is an interesting uh, organization. Uh, it was a spin-off from a United Nations uh, agency. It's called the Global Reporting Initiative. It's a completely, what they've done is a voluntary participation, but they have an auditing uh, function. Uh, they have created a framework by which corporations, businesses all around the world can um, uh, submit a document. Uh, that's sort of comparable to an ISO document that says here is how we think about our company and our business in terms of uh, uh, corporate social responsibility. And in the, in the seven years, there have been a thousand organizations, and there are four that come from China. 
which are major companies. And I thought that was really interesting. There are none from, uh, from uh, Taiwan, for example. Um, okay, here's another really interesting data point. Um, it's more historical that not too many people understand or know. China has had a very highly evolved civil structure based on Confucianism and Taoism, which predated the creation myths. So they didn't create God first. They didn't say, oh, there must have been a God who created everything. It said, okay, let's deal with what is. Okay, Taoism, Confucianism is kind of what is, human society, natural society. And then only after that, 100 years, couple hundred years later, there were creation myths. China has had to deal with foreign invasions. Okay, uh, let me move along a little bit more quickly. Here is one of the ways that, again, a very imperfect kind of metaphor. If China is a rock star, then these are some of the characteristics of a rock star. The US model, really what is wrong with the US model is the concept of instant gratification. Right? And so what do we do with that? How do you, how do you, and China of course is going through that because that's what this is all about. As an investor, when I look at China, this is how I think about it. Unpredictable. I need to understand, again, the ecosystem. Focus on personal relationships. I have to expand the dimensions, my antenna. I need to look at things in a very different light than I'm, I'm accustomed to. And I have to accept and work with major differences from what I'm, I'm used to. Cautionaries, what, what are the problems I'm, I'm dealing with? One is this thing called, I call contextual confusion. Personal blind spots, things I can't see because I'm not aware of them. I don't know how to think about them. Who do I trust? Can I align interests and expectations? What are the hidden agendas? Impatience is my biggest problem, okay? Benjamin Franklin, he that can have patience can have what he will. So this is my summary, my, my final statement. It's a call for action. And, and obviously the, the question is really, who's learning, what can we all learn from each other? And the call for action is a challenge to all of you and to, to everyone, which, whichever your interests are, whether they're research or academic and so on. You know, I, I thought it was really interesting and, and very effective that uh, Tom and the organizers chose two female uh, keynote speakers yesterday because I think that this is going to sound sexist, and it really isn't that. The, 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 the soft, more personal, human-to-human -human approach to engaging in China is really the right way to go. Okay? Hard data and being legalistic and being hard-edged and saying you have to do it this way because that's just not going to fly because they'll sit back and they'll just say, you don't understand China, we're not, going to, we're not going to talk to you. So, last statement, my observation, human society will never proceed like a scientific experiment. It will not be driven by objective data. It's messy, it's emotional, it's diverse, and it's always changing. And that's China today. Thank you. We're going to go now, uh, we're going to go from fear and fascination um, to information scarcity, market peculiarities, and decision making for sustainable and clean tech investors in China uh, from Chris Rachowski, who will bring you um, a summary of some of his, his perceptions as well, but also uh, he has quite a track record on the business front and has a lot to share. And, and for me, this is, of course is very exciting because it brings business to this forum and business thinking as well as the academic, which is so vital. Uh, thank you for the introduction. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And thanks especially to the event organizers. Uh, it's coming from the business world also, I don't get a chance to speak in, t in front of, and interact with this type of audience very much. So it's, it's really interesting for me. Um, I just wanted to share a little personal thought I had sitting up there and looking at the audience. Um, for me, as an entrepreneur in China, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a moment, it goes back maybe five, six years, and it's somehow a very curious group that we have in front of us because there's one person here that five years ago I had dinner with in China when I was trying to figure out what the logo should be for this company. There's another person here that visited us in our first office, which was three offices ago, probably three or four years ago in China. Um, there are other people that were here, not now, but yesterday, that I work with today and have worked with for the last several years. So somehow, it's a very interesting group of people that has been 
collected together here. Any case, um, with that little uh, quip from myself, let's uh, dig into this. The topic of this whole event being sort of information and in the environment, and for, for me what that really means is um, energy, energy, sustainable energy technologies in China. That's our business. And to give you a little idea why I might be standing here, our company founded maybe about five years ago in Beijing, which is where I live, um, is focused completely on developing sustainable energy technologies in China. And not from a capacity building point of view, not from simply a consulting point of view, but from investing in commercial projects in sustainable energy technologies, which of course goes directly to the point of environmental issues. Um, so that's why one of the reasons it's a pleasure for me to be here and, and see everyone. Um, in addition, we do plenty of other things, consulting advisory, but um, our, our core is founded on the idea of sustainable energy in China. And when we started that five years ago, people really thought we were a little bit crazy. Um, you know, myself and my business partners living in Beijing, um, frankly, our first projects were educating companies and people, what is this strange thing? So we went from a point where just five years ago in China, outside of circles such as UN and NGOs, this concept was fairly new and very confusing to today, where we've heard yesterday and today, and I've seen on a daily basis in China, I have provincial government officials asking me about energy efficiency and renewable energy technologies, and even more surprising, carbon reduction. Um, a tremendous change in five years. Um, I'm going to try and keep to a time frame here um, so I don't get the hook. Uh, that's a quick summary of what I'm going to talk about, but I'll just skip that and go into the details. Um, I want to give you a little framework foundation for why what is happening, at least in my industry, is important today in China. Why is it significant? And I'm going to communicate that in economic terms, not in why is it good for the environment and all these types of things. In economic terms, there is a lot of activity in China um, in the clean tech area in business development. Just looking at sort of the venture area, um, in la 2006, in the first quarter of this year, quite a lot of money and deals have been done in China. I borrowed this uh, um, without shame from the clean tech ventures, uh, a good group. But basically there's over 500 million US dollars in pure clean tech deals in China in that period of time. Uh, I think that shows that there's a significant healthy industry developing there. If you, see, and if you look there, most of that is in the energy area. Um, and that's really what's the engine driving China today. And I think that's why you see so much of the focus on investment in that area. It's growing tremendously fast. Um, this is a market that grew in triple digits over the last few years. Um, it looks rather bubblish, but without sort of defending this point, I would suggest that there is a huge foundation for why this is not a bubble such as the internet bubble. Um, there's a fundamental need for energy. There's fundamental global um, energy security issues. This is something, this is a, uh, a business area that's going to grow quite a lot in the future in China. And furthermore, to give you a scale of what things look like in the future, um, I, I do a lot of work in the wind project development area in China. So I took a little bit of information there and I've um, gratuitously expanded that over a wider area. Um, but if you just look at what's going to happen in wind investment, wind project development in China in the next 15 years, it's fairly reasonable to say that between debt and equity going into these projects, there will be 100 billion US dollars invested in only wind energy technology in China, adding up to somewhere close to 100 gigawatts of installed wind power. Um, that's a slightly aggressive number, but um, less aggressive than I was talking about l last year, and things are moving quickly there. If you expand that into everything, including VC and all the other types of clean tech, I think it's very, very conservative to say that there'll be over $250 billion invested in China during that period of time. That is big business, and it's, uh, it's grown far beyond you know, the, what helped it 
develop, which is capacity building in NGOs and government organizations. So getting to the point of information and information from an investor's point of view in China. I'm going to talk about three, I guess, stages of using information. One is finding it. Two is sort of qualifying it. And three is how do you use this information? And I'll be speaking mostly from a point of obviously foreign investment, foreign investors trying to operate in China. Um, first, where is all this information coming from? As a business person, what is useful in China? Um, of course, in China, there are plenty of government statistics. Um, I think this is a good foundation for macro level views of what's going on in the country. Uh, we've all certainly heard stories about how statistics are ma manipulated and this and that. But at the end of the day, it certainly gives you at least an order of magnitude view of what's going on. Um, but that's far from what we need in business decisions. Um, our experiences in North America and Europe it, with industry associations, in my view, tend to be fairly good. You get good information there. In China, it's a little more limited. We've heard a number of people talk about how information is very valuable and often protected in China. Um, in early day, my early days in China, which are um, not too long ago, um, I was a little surprised by how difficult it was to not only just ex extract basic information from industry groups or even the government on specific areas, but the pure lack of having that information available. We've heard that from a number of people already. Um, in any case, although these organizations are useful to be involved with, um, they probably are not a great source of information for um, business decisions. Um, legal and accounting support, we haven't talked too much of that, but as investors in China, you certainly will be involved with lawyers and accounting firms. Um, very, very important. Um, but I guess one of the keys there is to be able to work with both domestic firms and international firms. The domestic firms, if you find a good one, are going to tell you what's actually going on in the country. And the international firms are going to be necessary for you to communicate with your international investors or yourself. Um, and you really need a good blend between that. Um, advisory firms. One of the things I'm going to hit on a bit here is the need to actually be in China to understand what's going on and to make decisions, which I'm glad to say is a recurring theme in presentations so far. However, uh, we come across a lot of investors and entrepreneurs who want to do something in China and aren't quite there yet. And they're very gung-ho and want to do something, and they tend to depend a bit on specialist advisory firms or individuals that happen to be in China, which is a good starting point and I think very necessary. In fact, we even provide some of that for people. But at the end of the day, um, it's the bottom line here that's most important. And for people that want to use information, want to understand information to make business decisions in China, you really have to have your feet on the ground. There's, um, this is true in any environment, but I think especially true in China um, because it's just so very hard to really understand what would be what's happening there without being involved on a long-term basis. Um, this sounds like a, maybe a trite, simple piece of advice, um, which it is, but I still come across this many times in investors who are moving fairly quickly and really haven't taken the time to engage with China and really understand what's going on. So if you've managed to collect information, um, how do you interpret it? And how do you, more importantly, how do you qualify it? Um, I'm feeling pretty good about some of these comments here because I had a good lead into this of uh, the previous presentation. Some of these points have already been made. Um, I guess the first point, in hard data, that's relatively, well, let's just say you, you can check that fairly easy. Well, maybe not easy, but at least you can check hard data on how many power plants are there in China, how much money has been spent in this city for these you know, water treatment facilities, what have you. It's the soft data, which is very, very difficult. And it's the soft data on which ultimately management decisions are made. Um, 
And this, again, is why having feet on the ground is important. Not only that, but having a good business partner's feet on the ground with you. And by that, I mean a really local uh, business partner. Um, I, I've been in China not for very long, starting about 1999. Um, so I feel like I know a bit about what's going on there. However, if I'm advising myself or if I'm advising partners or clients, with that experience or even twice that experience, I would still rely on a person who grew up in the culture and really understands, frankly, what the heck is going on uh, with all this soft information to really give advice to somebody that wants to invest money in China. I have, I myself maybe can give lots of good opinions and advice um, and help make decisions, but on a daily basis in China when I have to make decisions, I'm sitting with my local staff, I'm sitting with my local business partner and other business partners to really get a full assessment of what's going on because as long as I stay there, I think I will never fully understand some of the business culture, overall cultural issues going on. And in fact, uh, being a foreigner, I, even if I was and I'm not um, capable of being fully fluent in the language, it's just not possible to engage on a truly local level and figure out what's really going on. Um, and again, that sounds a bit trite, but I see the mistake all the time, so I feel free to repeat it often. Um, and I think when you've internalized that information for yourself, um, somehow you have to communicate that to other people. You have to translate that information to your business partners, investors, um, entrepreneurs working outside of China. And in our case, this is, these are our key partners, clients, what have you. Um, and that can be very difficult um, to help people that haven't been to China very much or in some cases have never been to China really understand what's going on. Um, for example, there are situations where making an investment in a wind project, I'll focus a bit on that and I'll even a last slide on that, the situation in China would be wholly and completely unacceptable for a project developer making a decision in Europe or North America. That doesn't slow down the number of people I see, including ourselves, developing wind projects in China. But there are fundamental differences in what in the business culture and what is this information telling us about project development in China or technology investment in China. Um, I guess everybody finds their own way of somehow communicating that to um, their partners outside of China. But a lot of attention has to be put on that. And, and again, because I experience on a daily basis, sometimes no matter how many times you explain a situation about what's really going on in China, it just does not fit into the framework of a foreigner's mind. Um, it can be repeated during a conference call by the individuals. It can be witnessed in person in China, but you'll find yourself many times six months later answering the same questions and explaining the same situation, which has once again become shocking to your business partners outside of China. Um, so putting all this information to work and all this um, knowledge building to work, uh, some key points. I already mentioned trusted local partners. Um, I could belabor this also for hours, but I can also count on probably more than one hand the number of um, people I've seen in China, businesses that have either trusted the wrong person or in many cases not even had a local person, uh, expert, cultural expert to rely on. Um, you really must have that if it's not in your personal background. You must be present in China. Um, Without a doubt, if you plan to have significant activity in China, you or part of your company, part of your business, really should be full-time on the ground. And that time is not measured in, I'm going to commit a lot this year, I'm going to spend a month in China. Um, for people that plan to have ongoing business there, it's living, I think, really living in China for a long term. With all this, even if you've managed to achieve all that, if you're still depending on sort of global participation in your venture in China, 
it's very, very important to be fast, um, which is a, one of the paradoxes, I would say, in China. You must be able to react very quickly to the business environment, but at the same time, you must be prepared to wait for months for the opportunity to react quickly, which is something that's tremendously frustrating um, and which I receive frequent beatings for myself from my investment partners. Um, this is the challenge of, one of the challenges of explaining China and business in China to um, foreign investors. Um, there are projects that I work on right now where we've been waiting for months and months and months for a government officials to make decisions, these types of things. And this is normal. This is typical in China, especially in Inner Mongolia. Um, and then it becomes very difficult for me to call up the board and say, OK, we're ready to go. Send the money tomorrow. I, I know the money's been waiting there, and it takes time, but it has to go tomorrow. I, I know I, we've been waiting four months, yes, I know, but it has to go tomorrow. Um, I'm sure other people have had similar experiences. Um, this is the last slide, so I'll go a couple minutes over. Um, I, I was asked for some case studies, so I've given one example here. As you've heard, I am involved with developing some wind projects in Inner Mongolia. Um, if you know anything about developing wind in China, that um, should raise your eyebrows immediately anyway. Um, it is very much the Wild West of wind in the world. It's sort of a crazy environment. Um, there are dozens and dozens of local developers. Every one of them has a great project. That project only needs, as quickly as possible, your money to help develop it successfully. Um, fortunately, there are many, many, many herds of foreign investors that are very eager to participate in that. Um, we just had a long discussion about all these factors that are, at least in my view, important to be successful in China. In this eagerness, people tend to forget. Um, it, people forget that, yes, actually it's fairly easy to meet senior officials and be treated well, and they walk out drunkenly stumbling out of their dinner with 20 officials, and they are convinced that they are the ones that found the solution. They found the key, and they're going to be successful. I don't know what happened to all these other guys, but they must have done something wrong. But I've got all these friends, and I'm going to be successful. I see it happening fairly frequently. Um, I think in the best case in these situations, foreign investors sober up, and they get their feet on the ground, and they assess the situation, and ultimately make good business decisions. Um, I would say very typically, a lot of time and money is spent. Um, people have fun, and it's exciting and interesting. And at the end of the day, something implodes, and the project is gone. Uh, many people keep coming back, and they learn from that and are successful. But it is, it is uh, difficult. And I would say that the cycle will never stop. It will always continue. And in my experience, I was just having meetings this week in San Francisco um, in a similar situation. It's not bad necessarily, but a group of people who are ready to sign a contract, a rarely, fairly loose agreement for a wind project in China, and everybody's making decisions from San Francisco. Um, yes, there's business travel, um, but at the end of the day, we're depending on lawyers, um, our staff that you know, can communicate via telephone here and speak in Chinese, which people think is a great benefit, and it is, but it's not enough. Um, so um, I guess that's all I really have to say, and thank you very much. I love that last slide. It's sort of like the Nigerian scam that comes your way in email every day. Um, we get, I get a lot of those. Best projects, boy, yeah, I got the rights and signed the MOU and life is good. Wrong. Uh, Robert Collier is going to give us a, his, some of his perspectives uh, gained from a couple of decades as a journalist around the world. So it's also, it's not just China intensive, but it's also comparative to some extent. Uh, Robert. Thanks very much. Um, as uh, Jeremy mentioned, um, I'm really a, <coughs> a generalist, uh, not a China specialist. Um, I've covered um, international affairs as a reporter for about 20 years, uh, increasingly uh, focused on international energy markets and um, global warming, and increasingly on China. Uh, 
over those years and in all that experience, I, I've come to a, a few realizations um, of so -called, about so-called green economics. Uh, one of those truths is, uh, despite what Amory Lovins uh, sometimes appears to uh, be saying, uh, the logic of the free market by itself is not enough to drive uh, the green energy revolution. A careful, careful government regulation of the markets and deliberate government policies to foster alternative energy are needed to uh, drive those markets and to eliminate hidden subsidies, uh, to conventional, uh, more polluting energy forms, and to create the various market mechanisms that will foster private investment of the green kind. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you all uh, read the Wall Street Journal a couple weeks ago when Al Gore was named a partner of Kleiner Perkins, a venture capital firm down in Silicon Valley. Um, the Wall Street Journal ran a long editorial uh, about Gore being named to this position, uh, of course, sneering, uh, saying that uh, Gore was named uh, just for his ability as a regulatory rainmaker, that he was going to help create government regulation and work with his Democrat friends in Congress to create the regulations that would help the VC market. Uh, now, the tone, of course, was the, of the editorial was the Wall Street Journal's own brand of politics, uh, but the, the, the substance of it was not off base in that uh, green venture capital, the green tech market, is indeed heavily uh, uh, driven by government laws and regulations. And this is true, of course, in the United States and around the world, in Europe. Uh, Germany, for example, the, really the, the champion of renewable uh, technologies, wind and solar, uh, is uh, the growth of solar especially is uh, heavily dependent on their feed-in tariff law, um, which is really a model for the world. In California, of course, uh, the, this Governor Schwarzenegger's policies have, have, are really driving uh, the whole industry. Uh, China, of course, as we've seen in the in previous uh, uh, comments, has had a lot of success. In a large part, that's, again, because of uh, new government laws uh, passed in the past couple of years for renewable energy. The 2006 renewable energy law uh, set a target of increasing renewable energy use from the present, uh, the then 10% to about 20% of total energy consumption by 2020 and of that 20%, about 8% would come from non-hydro renewable energy. Um, again, as we've seen, I won't, uh, there, there's been a great deal of success in a huge flood of capital going into renewable energy in, in China and a rapid increase in uh, wind and solar, among other things. Um, however, uh, there, there's a few difficulties with uh, this uh, this progress that I think need to be pointed out uh, because they indicate uh, areas in which Chinese government policy still has uh, a ways to go uh, to help foster renewable energy farther than uh, it already is. For example, just to take one example, solar uh, PV production. China has become a, a leader in internationally in solar PV production. However, less than 5% of that PV production is sold in China. And more than 95% comes to California and Europe, uh, in large part because China does not have a feed-in tariff uh, law such as uh, Germany and Spain have. Um, instead, it follows the more the UK, California model of, of, of direct subsidies, which many experts say is less uh, efficient as a market mechanism for driving uh, the development of the industry. Uh, also, there's a, there's a whole slew of uh, market uh, uh, mechanisms in China uh, that, uh, in the financial system, that uh, act to dissuade the growth of renewable energy uh, development. Uh, the big regulated industries in China, which are building on the average of three large coal-fired power plants a week, do not have the same uh, uh, legal framework and financial framework that uh, clean energy developers have. Uh, 
the big utilities have invested at least $50 billion per year for the past several years. However, uh, of that, uh, less than 10% has been uh, in any recognizable uh, form of clean energy. Uh, now, in part, of course, the, this disbalance is, is for the same reason as anywhere else in the world. Uh, the um, lenders uh, are unfamiliar with the clean energy business, and the developers are unfamiliar also with the business and in dealing with investors uh, in this. But uh, China has its own special set of barriers, um, such as a very complex set of uh, investment controls and corporation rules, uh, usury laws, uh, special lending rules, and also weak IPR protection for uh, clean tech. Um, in addition, the, gov the central government, as, as we heard yesterday, the central government uh, often uh, doesn't have all the uh, policy levers that it needs to get uh, local governments to follow central government dictates. Now, um, one of the main, of course, international recipes that have been come up with for funding uh, uh, clean tech in China is the clean development mechanism under the Kyoto Protocol. And China is the largest single recipient of uh, CDM funds with about $15 billion in credits registered over the past couple of years. Um, and this is all uh, very well and good. There have been a number of critics, of course, of the CDM process. Uh, some have said that these funds were largely superfluous, going to projects that would have gotten funded anyhow. Um, others, other critics have said that uh, perhaps the most important beneficiaries of these CDM projects are the foreign companies themselves, who uh, plus all their legions of brokers and lawyers and consultants uh, who benefit from uh, these projects. Anyways, the foreign companies buy the, the, the carbon credits from China at a cost that is far below their cost of mitigation at home. So in other words, without CDM, uh, it would be uh, much more costly for these foreign companies to obey their uh, carbon reduction obligations at home. And so many, in many cases, these, uh, in many senses, it's foreign companies, not uh, the domestic needs of CDM recipients that's driving the whole uh, CDM market. Now, as we speak um, here this weekend uh, in Bali at the uh, UN climate talks, uh, the issue of clean tech is, is being uh, debated and negotiated uh, hotly. Um, and there's some interesting policy disagreements uh, that are worth uh, noting. Um, largely, it's, it's all about, well, clean tech, of course, is an industry. And an industry means money. And the hard question being, well, who gets that money? Who profits? And there are major uh, uh, business interests at play. Um, Western uh, investors and their governments, of course, want to get most of the benefit uh, from that industry. Uh, developing country uh, investors and their governments want to get most of the uh, benefit and most of the profit. Uh, so there are, there are classic um, uh, business conflicts that uh, are familiar to anybody who follows the whole WTO process. Um, now, there, in specifically in, in regards to green tech, the United States and the EU have made a proposal at Bali to eliminate barriers to trade in clean energy uh, technologies, such as wind and solar, uh, as part of the WTO uh, Doha process. Uh, China and other developing countries, on the other hand, uh, are uh, demanding that uh, IPR protections on clean tech be relaxed. In other words, that developing countries be allowed to uh, get um, uh, patents for the, uh, or get these technologies without the, having to pay for the patents. Um, now, um, it, to a certain extent, it's unclear whether uh, if China and other countries were given uh, uh, clean tech uh, patent free, whether China and specific, specifically wouldn't just turn around and turn that into a huge export industry, uh, which would be, of course, good business, but it's not necessarily what the climate talks process is, is, is intended for. Um, on the other hand, 
other developing nations that do not have China's uh, uh, expertise and, and just incredible uh, uh, talent at export industries, other developing countries definitely do need some sort of patent uh, relaxation. Uh, so how can the Doha talks bridge uh, these differ differing uh, potentials and capacities under, uh, of developing nations is a really tough question. Um, at the same time, of course, the Bush administration uh, is uh, pretending that, um, that cl the clean tech revolution will happen by the magic of the free market um, it uh, is opposing any sort of uh, clean tech fund, uh, such as developing nations are proposing, uh, just as at, in the Asia Pacific Partnership, which is essentially uh, a completely private sector driven process with the U US federal government is putting up almost no cash toward it. Uh, the, US, the US delegation at Bali is uh, pretending that uh, the whole clean tech process will happen again sort of by osmosis um, and uh, it's not necessary to put any real uh, multilateral uh, cash uh, toward that process. So anyways, it, the, the, the general upshot is there's, you know, there's a huge amount of business at stake, there's a huge, huge amount of potential at stake in uh, China and elsewhere, but in China as elsewhere it's almost a truism that uh, the clean tech revolution is not going to happen uh, just by the valiant uh, efforts of foreign investors uh, or even by domestic investors without the appropriate government policy structure uh, driving and facilitating investment in the right directions. Thank you. Now we're going to hear from Daniel Spitzer, um, who has had uh, significant on the ground experience in China, uh, doing some very, very interesting projects, um, very important projects. Save energy, save distractions. <laughs> I'm not a very good speaker, so bear with me, please. <clears throat> Maybe pathological optimist, um, or at least resiliently hopeful person, um, everything my panelists have said rings true to me. I'm, I'm an accidental China guy. I, am, you know, I'm, I, I still think of myself as new to China in many ways. I've been involved in Asia for a long time. I moved to Asia in 1976. I've spent 25 of the last 30 years based in Asia. You need to be in Asia to make it real in business. Um, you can't dabble in it. Um, I've been involved with China since um, managing uh, operating our financial businesses in China since 1986. Um, and in 1993, I really felt that I could no longer deny that China was the game that I needed to play in and really focus on. And so I've been running businesses in, uh, in about 10 countries in Asia. Uh, at that point, it was private equity investing. And I really I decided I had to build an operating business in China um, that had that addressed environmental and social issues and, of course, had economic praxis. Um, you know, in the words of former professor at Berkeley, a professor of mine, Wes Churchman, this is all about systems approach. At China, every piece fits together in a really complex mosaic, and you can't, you can't develop any meaningful venture unless you really clearly think about all these things. Um, uh, I'm a strong believer in trying to find those environments in which you compete most easily, perhaps because the competition is less qualified or has less exposure. So I headed to the west of China in building one of my businesses. Um, it's an area which has been largely ignored until recently and still, frankly, is looked down on um, by most people in, in Beijing and Shanghai and uh, along the coast. Not much capital, not many new ventures. Um, I was fortunate to have a wonderful um, mentor, late mentor, um, uh, who's Chinese, who gave me a lot of guidance along the way um, and taught me a great deal culturally and also in terms of his um, uh, deep love of China and patriotism and fearlessness about the need to stick to values and, and to know what really matters. Uh, 
Um, I'm not Chinese, uh, but um, it's been a privilege to be a guest uh, and to raise my children there and to, and to live there and spend so much time there. I now split my time between uh, China and the Bay Area, but um, really China is where I have to be. And whenever I'm not there, um, I always feel like I'm a fraud uh, doing my businesses in China because you need to be there to be real. So even though I do think of China and communicate with China every day of my life, when I'm physically not there, which then there are some days, I really, I do feel like a fraud. Um, first business that I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna talk about two ventures that, that I've built. The first one uh, was addressing a multi-pronged problem. Um, part of it was uh, rainforest um, deforestation in Indonesia, Malaysia. If you flew over that part of the world in, in the 80s or early 90s, you'd see concentric circles being, being cut down uh, by the time a lot of Japanese and some Korean multinationals in collaboration with, um, with uh, local landowners, or not even landowners, and government often. Um, uh, but huge, huge uh, desecration. And there was this sucking sound in the north. Um, China starting to buy and use a lot of its, at that time, very scarce foreign exchange to buy mostly thin plywood made from tropical hardwood trees. So that was one problem. China, on the other hand, had, um, had a forest coverage ratio per capita that was equivalent to Chad. Uh, it really, such um, destruction for other reasons of its, of its forest resources for many years, historical reasons and a lack of understanding and so forth, that um, huge constraints and issues. Um, so the business that I built with my late partner was um, plantation timber products combined reforestation, replanting in China with fast growth trees, not, mono, not only not monoculture, and we can talk about that issue later on. I'm sure there's some people in Berkeley who are, who are concerned about that. It's a good thing to think about. But anyway, with fast growth trees, which could serve as a cash crop to farmers, uh, which we used to pulp and to make into medium density fiberboard, thin you know, three millimeter medium density fiberboard is a direct import substitute for the tropical hardwood plywood. And we also made downstream products like flooring and wall panels and things like that. Uh, other people had been involved in, in reforestation. For example, the World Bank had put about $700 million into that field uh, by the early 90s, but their experience was that because there was no economic cycle, there was no demand for these fast growth trees that the farmers would abandon the um, uh, growing these trees because there was really no reason for them to do so. And Chinese farmers, those of you who have spent time in the countryside, and I know at least a couple of people here I, I know from experience have, um, they're very pragmatic. And if they don't get a return on what they're growing, they're going to stop. So we ended up eventually with 700,000 farmers growing trees to support uh, our plants. Uh, I'm not going to go into huge detail on the project, but it's an interesting project or series of businesses. First, first plant was a $50 million first phase. After getting all of the local approvals and confirming that I liked it, my partner liked it, and raising some money to complement our monies. Uh, different kinds of financing because you need to use different kinds of financing, structured financing. And this was at a time when no U.S. banks provided any debt capital for projects in China. Um, uh, so this was, a un this was the first of its kind limited recourse project financing um, in China. Um, and actually the World Bank was quite helpful there, uh, but lots of European banks, frankly. It took 18 months at State Planning Commission in Beijing after it had already circulated up there to get approvals. Um, we were told it could be expedited. Um, there would have been cost for that. And my partner uh, you know, looked me in the eyes. And I was not about to you know, carry a paper bag there anyway. But anyway, he said, he said you know, China is my country, and I'm, I'm an old man. And I'll be damned if I'm going to do anything that's going to that's gonna hurt China. You know, we will keep this a, a pure business. And, and we did. And we eventually did get the approvals. You know, lots of, lots of hoops to jump through, and some of them are simply administration. So persistence is a, a key takeaway. Uh, processes take a long time. Education is very important. Connecting with people and, and getting buy-in on lots and lots of levels, and there are often legitimate reasons 
why things take a long time according to their process. And frankly, we're all guests there. Or almost all of us are guests there. Got approvals, built the plant, a lot of capacity online. Nobody understood it. Had to go through all the education process of explaining to people why this was a, a, a good, a viable substitute. Um, so all of that marketing, and this is a national business, and built a couple of more plants. It's $50 million for a production line and ended up with four production lines and the downstream line. So a fair amount of capital deployed in the business. Um, national business, uh, uh, sales offices and warehouses around the country. When we went downstream and built a brand and an identity that was green, and, and we pioneered the green industry and forest products in China, uh, there was no initially no recognition of this at all, what it meant. And so we had to go into popular media and popular advertising, so things like national television advertisements and sides of buses and, and all of that kind of media which is used in China. Um, but a lot of it was education and trying to, you know, open eyes in China to, to the need for green. Green was not a word in vocabulary during the mid and, and even in the late 90s, it really, the green only became a word in, um, in uh, after 2000 or so. But we spent a lot of time trying to, trying to educate and to bring our brethren in the industry to a standard by creating a national association. And of course, instead of having uh, one of my general managers as the head, we had general managers from all of the 17 players in the industry as co as co vice presidents and had an academic government person as as the head because you know in China you must do it appropriately and you should never be the leader yourself. It's always better to do things together. Um, but that worked and we ended up with environmental certification in that industry. And while it was compromised perhaps in some cases, you know, there were standards um, that are clear and verifiable, and change is possible, education is, is, is possible, and, you know, key takeaway. Next project that I've, so built that business, ended up becoming a large wholesale business, made consumer products, went into the consumer sector, um, found that we couldn't really find distributors who could represent our values, and our values are really important for us, um, as ident in, internally in terms of our identity, and also in terms of understanding our product quality, which is demonstrably superior. Um, and aside from the demonstrably superior product qualities, the actual value of doing something which is green and environmentally responsible, which maybe has an intangible value, but it's not demonstrably better, but to get people to start to appreciate that, even though, frankly, we were never paid for that. Um, but it was an important part of our identity. So we ended up having to go retail, and over time opened up a 1,000 stores in China. So this became a fully articulated business from growing trees and chemical refineries and pulping processing and wholesale warehouses, 25 of them around the country, to a 1,000 stores in China. Um, my partners and I sold the business in 2004 um, to a major multinational, international paper group, to one of their subsidiaries. Since subsequently, it's been spun off a couple of times. Um, you know, Wall Street said to international paper, why don't you focus on your knitting, which is paper, and get rid of your forest products businesses and so it and some other things were sold for $3 billion to somebody and then it was spun off again, but these things happen. But we built a business that was, that was very successful, very profitable, and really meaningful. And those of you who haven't spent time in China building operating companies or working closely with students or, or cohorts or professors, there's a really important takeaway for me, something that I learned, which is that many Chinese, like all of us, have been searching for meaning, a meaning and purpose to their lives. And for many people, the party was profoundly meaningful. For those of you who have friends, Chinese friends, who are in their 60s or 70s or maybe late 50s, many of these people loved the party profoundly. And it was really great. And I have, I have a, a dear friend who said he loved the party more than his family. Dear, in his close relationship, he loved the party more than his family. And it wasn't, this is a, a brilliant guy. And it wasn't until he came to the States doing graduate work that he 
It was for him, when he said it was like seeing the earth from the moon, that he, and he's a party member and, and reasonably senior in his area, that, that he had a different view of this. In any case, I'm not talking about the party, which has brought great value in my, in my mind to China um, historically, but the point is, socially, there are many Chinese who feel less belief in the party than they used to, we can say that, and, um, and maybe have, they need a, something to believe in. Many of them have the capacity for, and on some levels, a great love for China and patriotism, but they're not really sure how to direct that, and there's a lot of complexity. Um, and green and doing good is, became a really important reason to be for, for many of members of our organization. And the idea of doing something significant that, that is green is, 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 was profound. My, uh, this, is, this is data observed pretty objectively. And so comment to journalists out there, please play on these heartstrings and, and, and play with, with, um, with great information. Uh, side note, last night, I was reflecting on what I heard yesterday, and I was really struck by the profound role of public opinion and the importance, significance of journalism um, in making sure that the information gets out there. And I felt pretty small, because even though I've built companies with thousands of employees and, and hundreds of thousands of stakeholders, growers and so forth, um, and companies that have paid hundreds of millions of renminbi in taxes and affected large areas, and we've had hundreds of teachers who we sponsor. Um, actually, journalists can get information out there to much greater levels and go to great risk um, and don't always have the chance to make the same amount of money. So journalists, I mean, really, ring your bell. You know, you, it's a very important to do. Sorry, I know I'm talking long. Um, so another project I'm doing now, so that project worked. You can do projects, you can be aspirational, you can be altruistic, you have to be hard-nosed and resilient. You have to know how to take a knock. Um, another business that I'm building now, also in Western China, is, is um, reforesting, replanting um, mid-elevation slopes that have um, been deforested uh, with, um, and these are slopes that are 35 to 50 degrees, um, that um, are now in imminent danger of, um, of becoming rock face. Uh, and this is an area that Ma Jun may comment on later, and he knows it pretty well, where they're putting in a series of um, probably will be hugely destructive um, dams with all the three gorges kind of, uh, you know, shattering of the environment kinds of, kinds of impact that you can read about. Uh, so the, the point here is establishing an economic cycle by planting um, fruit and nut-bearing trees on these slopes that will um, create sustainability because it's attractive for for villagers to grow, farmers to look after these because they can have income uh, and it will reestablish the A horizon, the soil layer, um, and uh, protects the environment and has a huge effect on, on you know, the knock-on effects here when you, when you either lose a green slope or when you gain a rock face are profound in terms of the environment and flora and fauna um, and watershed and so forth. And, we don't have any financial success there yet, um, uh, but since I'm the lead investor, I'm hoping we will. Uh, um, but I know that it's possible to do. I know that it takes a huge amount of patience to do any of this. You need to be on the ground. You need to work closely with your Chinese counterparts to decipher and understand, and a lot of this is, um, is subtle. But it is, you know, I bring a message of hope today. Um, you know, you, you can do it, uh, but it takes a hell of a lot of time and a lot of education and, and going local. Um, so I spoke quickly. Um, uh, there are many Chinas. It, it, you know, we speak about it as one place. There are many Chinas, and those people who spend time only in the big cities don't know what I consider the real China. Um, but maybe that's just because I'm more comfortable in the countryside. But I really I urge people who go to China for their look-sees to actually get out into the countryside. Getting to the west is good, but you don't have to go to the west. At least spend time in villages and see how people really live. But here's just an interesting anecdote. Maybe I haven't seen this written up at all. Southwestern China, Yunnan, Sichuan, 
Guangxi, uh, Guizhou, um, that whole area right now. Uh, if you go into the countryside, you can't get diesel fuel. So I was there recently, um, very recently, and in small villages, the trucks are lined up with no fuel. Hundreds of trucks in a row outside of filling stations. Really interesting. I haven't read about this anywhere. But check it out. So, I mean, maybe some journalists can, can write about it and dig into this. But, you know, if you go, you know, it's in big cities, you know, Kunming and in Chengdu, Ya'an, places like that, you'll certainly find, you'll find diesel fuel. But if you go out into the countryside, no diesel fuel right now. It's a very interesting thing. Anyway, thank you so much. You're on a beach, and you find a lamp, and you rub the lamp, and out comes a genie and gives you three wishes. Pochi? What are your three wishes for getting green in investment and projects in China and all of the rest of you? Think about it, too. Oh, my goodness. Um. It's got to be the first thing that comes to your mind. <laughs> one? Okay. Robert, you're first. Uh, I think... Uh, in terms of simple capitalization and, and finding enough uh, capital to more capital to put into this uh, into clean tech in China, um, of course, the biggest potential source of capital is the Chinese central bank, which has, of course, the world's largest reserves of 1.4 trillion, uh, none of which, to my knowledge, is uh, invested in any shape or form in any way in clean tech. I think the United States and the World Bank, which the U.S. controls, could uh, do a wonderful service by proposing some sort of international multilateral fund that the Chinese Central Bank could then invest in uh, for a clean tech development around the world, but especially uh, in China. Uh, the Chinese government, the Central Bank, recently started a $200 billion uh, sovereign wealth fund uh, to invest outside of the usual U.S. treasuries that it invests in. But to my knowledge, none of that is being invested in clean tech either. So I think that would be a great proposal or a great thing that the U.S. especially would have to take some leadership on uh, using probably the World Bank uh, to help leverage China's own financial resources. Uh, yeah, this is very good that, that Rob went first because actually uh, I've been scribbling down some ideas that could use money like that. And I was thinking about the open source movement in software, you know, how that has really uh, spawned uh, tremendous uh, growth in the software industry. And if you look at an analogy in the clean tech side, uh, wouldn't it be nice if we could develop a clean tech toolkit? which would be sort of open source clean technologies. And so you, you know, you'd need a fund that would acquire and develop intellectual property, and preferably at a more fundamental platform level. It could acquire a lot of technology that's already available and, and off patent or late patent, and it could also develop some new things. It would be really a, a wonderful way to, to get the international community of, of scientists and business people and, and uh, intellectual property people to, to put together really this toolkit. Um, and, and one of the beauties of it, of course, is you'd have all these experts behind it. You need the experts, this ecosystem of experts I talked about, because they, they have to not only develop, but they have to implement these technologies. But if you could make this toolkit available and have essentially an open license policy that might have some limited oligopoly. So you, know, you have a few competitors in each territory, however you want to define the territory. So you still have some market competition, some market forces. That could go really a long way in, in developing countries, in China or, or anywhere else in the world. And it probably isn't all that hard to do. Conceptually, it, it seems like a very straightforward thing. It's obviously very complex. There's questions of choice and people and blah, blah, blah. But it, it, the point is you're not providing solutions. You're providing tools. And I think that's what, what the world needs, is to focus on the tools. And then let them try lots of things. And that's what I admire about what China is doing, to say, hey, we'll try wind, we'll try geothermal, we'll try solar, we'll try all of these things. And oh, by the way, we have this huge dependence on coal. And you know, that's not going to go away anytime soon. So that's a reality. And that's one of those 
paradoxes. Anyway. I guess uh, I don't normally think in terms of wishes I would uh, have, but I think it's in China as it is in North America, U.S. or Europe, business people always hope for the government to uh, sort of clear some paths for them. I think there were some comments made about um, sort of putting mechanisms in place that would encourage alternative, different energy technologies. Um, and China's doing that. Um, of course, as a business person, would like to see that uh, move more quickly. But I wouldn't say that's specific to China. I would say that's true in the U.S. and other places as well. That would uh, make all business people's lives a little bit um, more rapid and move, moving more quickly in this area. Again, great comments by my panelists. Capital is, to get it mobilized politically is really important. Although I've never found it difficult to raise capital for good projects, and there's plenty of capital in China now, but to get a politically mandated pool of capital, a significant one, and commitment from, for example, from China for this, great idea. Toolkit, absolutely essential. Um, the key problem in a place like China, I believe, though, is, is management, is knowing how to implement and, and having enough models and training. And so this comes down to uh, how can we disseminate guidance, information, education and, on different levels and actually have training institutes. I've, I've been a capitalist, a venture capitalist before in a, in a, in a run a financial services business. So I've provided money before. I, money is not the answer. Engineering is not the answer by itself, although you have to get the stuff out there. So you need to also have really good, um, effective education and, and management training for this to happen. And, and because you know, Guanli in China, that is where we fall down. That's why things don't happen. So. OK. Um. How much time do we have, Tom? About five minutes. OK, so that means a couple of very short questions. So questions. Oh, three hands in the back. I see Guizhou. Is that right? The gal from, lady from Guizhou. Thank you. Um, my question is about the collaboration between uh, um, venture capital and the nonprofit. Uh, I wonder what would be a good model that you would suggest or you have uh, thought. Like um, my organization had some um, like environmental um, uh, like projects, also micro loan projects to help to, uh, to kind of push a little bit on, um, on some, you know, some project for local people to get some income. Um, like we wanted to have uh, like replanting, the planting trees um, in Guizhou and also in Shanxi. Uh, our dilemma is, um, you know, we can give them the seed fund and also local people, sometimes we can mobilize volunteer laborers. They, they would like to, to work on things. Um, but sometimes we lack of the resources like mentoring, training, and the coaching to help them also marketing to help to keep them uh, successful. Like our micro loan uh, is the third version. The first two failed. So we're trying to figure out what education, how we can collaborate with um, um, you know, entrepreneur uh, model to make, it, uh, to make it work. Daniel, I see your Thank head you. nodding. No, I mean, just I... nodding that, yes, those, those are very real problems. And I speak to lots of NGOs in China that are facing these same issues. Um, and there is not an effective private, um, private public partnership or private <coughs> corporate uh, NGO partnership at this point. I think a lot of it, again, has to do with um, awakening consciousness and re recognition by Chinese, particularly um, the new corporate leaders and the new very wealthy, um, that, that they have a role in the China they love. Um, and that is to provide funding. So I, I think this is a, a great opportunity, but I think, it's a, the, the, I think this comes down to journalism and effective communication to a large extent so people understand what they're, that, they can, that they can and must make a difference themselves. 
I, I'd like to add one, one quick question, uh, comment. I, I think this is a very important time and a particularly important topic where NGOs need to kind of rethink what they really do, what they represent. Because on the one hand, information flow, information dissemination is very important, but especially the urgency of clean tech and, and the environmental issues, especially in China, require more action. So I think that this is a good time to begin those kinds of discussions with capital sources, with entrepreneurs and, and investors and the business community. Um, I see Dominic has his hand raised. Do I see a, a mic someplace? Okay, uh, right, right over here. And then we'll have one more question after that. My apologies. Dominic Yin from Hong Kong. It's a pity I, I could not come yesterday because I was invited by the Department of Commerce to Boston, to Los Angeles, and this is final stop to learn the new technology for P2E2, energy efficiency and pollution prevention. I have a few comments. First of all, when everybody about, you know, when, when Mr. Wu mentioned about China fear, uh, that means China threat, uh, I don't agree with this. Because uh, two and a half years ago, I made a speech in uh, Washington, D.C. They mentioned, you know, China threat at that time. Then uh, they said, you know, what, what's the proof? He said, you a Chinggis Khan Mongolian, you know, uh, went all the way to Europe. I say, you are wrong. Please go back to read your history. At that time, they are not China. They're barbarians. So his grandson came to China. We changed them from tiger to sheep in 100 years. And why the hell we build a Great Wall? Is that a uh, attacking weapon or defense? So don't worry about China, because we have 5,000 culture. We never want to conquer anybody. So please understand, there's no, no such thing as China threat. And also, you would never see in the whole world that we put Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucius in one temple. Have you seen this elsewhere in the world? We put them all together. How to say it in English. Okay. Now, the second comment I would like to uh, make. Uh, what is PRC, People Republic of China? P means, stands for patience. You guys in America don't have the patience. Go there, one, two, three, let's go. You know, you must have patience. Actually, we have, different, we have some cultural difference. You must have some patience to work with the Chinese. Plus, they've been closed for so many years. They, they don't understand foreigners. You, you got to have some patience to work with them. And R is risk. Yes, there are risk. Everywhere is risk. When we come to the United States, we have risk. You, you have we, we risk too. Try to understand their risk. And finally, C could be cultural difference or connections, which you call the Guan Xi. That is very, very important. Now, according to statistics, no matter where you go in China, the number one investor is still Hong Kong. I'm from Hong Kong. So Hong Kong is the best jumping board, the best bridge, because we understand China. We have the same cultural background. Use Hong Kong people. This is why recently I established this ESCO in Hong Kong, Hong Kong uh, Energy Service Companies. We accept not only foreign companies, Chinese companies, Hong Kong companies, we also accept universities, professors, even students, university students, of course, in order to build up uh, a big noise so that we can convince Hong Kong government, Guangdong government, and eventually Chinese government. Please use Hong Kong as a base. You won't, you won't uh, regret for what you have done. Uh, finally, I think you mentioned about education and management. 
I think training program is very, very important. I understand here in the United States, you have to take some courses to learn safety and then you can be a construction man. Then you can, you can go to the coal mine. But in China, anybody can be, can be a construction man, can be a coal mine worker, so that the average about five to 6,000 people die in the coal mine. So we need the help. Well, I understand there are over 200 courses here in the United States. Why don't you guys use your past experience and knowledge to go over there to give your friendship hands? Then you will gain more trust from the Chinese, but not treat Chinese as China threat. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. Uh, I, I just got a very rude mark, uh, you know, from, from Tom. I guess we have to leave the table, but I do want to tell you that I'm a very happy genie. <laughs> Your wishes are fabulous. Thank you.